The title of Lecture 3 is Alpha and Omega. Selected answers by Ambrose Worrell to questions from the audience will follow the lecture. Alpha and Omega. Some people say that Ambrose and Augur, but I don't think that's exactly right. <laughs> So Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I got to thinking about that some years ago, and I wrote up something that I thought might be of interest to you, especially if you think that you want to know the full trip and not just a portion of it like we were talking about. So this will be of interest to anyone who wants to go through the mental exercise of trying to figure out what it's all about. It has been said that man cannot comprehend the infinite. Everything has a beginning, apparently has to have an ending. So the poor finite mind, which we are most familiar with, cannot accept the possibility that something can be made out of nothing. Yet it is written, in the beginning the Lord made heaven and earth. Now that dispenses with everything in a very few words, doesn't it? We measure things in time, so we ask, when was the beginning? And you remember last week I said the beginning is now, a continuous operation. But if you're a student, he's really at the beginning, he's trying to learn. When was the beginning? And what was the nature of the thing that was begun? What did it look like? That's the kind of a question you might get from your children today. How are you going to answer it? <laughs> well, finding it very difficult, if not impossible, to define what was begun in the very beginning, or when the beginning began, man needs events that are meaningful to him to use as fulcrums to leave himself into the past and into the future. Man exists in time, therefore he had a beginning. But when and where? There are stories about the creation of man but they do not satisfy the inquiring mind that is interested in the infinite. And Adam, the first man, seems so vague and distant that you feel that something more recent would make a better fulcrum. So what are you going to use to lead yourself into the past and into the future? Why not use yourself? At least you think you know something about yourself, don't you? What were you in the beginning? You were a starting point. Can you say, I, a starting point? What is a point, you ask? Well, they say a point is that which has position, but no size. Not much of anything, is it? It has neither parts nor extent. Therefore, in the beginning, you required no space. In the beginning, you were not aware of anything not even yourself. 
In the beginning, because you required no space, and because you were totally unaware, time did not exist. And what is time, you ask? Time is that which makes space possible. You couldn't conceive of space without time, could you? It is that which produces events and makes observation possible. It gives birth to the observer, for without time there would be nothing to observe. Time is the mother of nature. Because you lacked awareness in the beginning, time and space did not exist. There was no observer, therefore you were at once both nothing and everything. You were also simultaneously both nowhere and everywhere. Then came the awakening. You became aware of self. You stepped out of eternity into time. You became both the observer and the one observed. The sense of separateness had been awakened within you. Awareness now became your master. The things observed by you, you desired and claimed for yourself. You experienced joy in the possession of things. Possession gave you a feeling of importance. The more you owned, the more important you felt. You were acquiring a considerable part of that which your limited awareness made you believe to be the whole. Yes, it would not be long, it seemed, before you would have everything, then you would be everything, the sole owner. Your awareness continued to expand the horizon which had offered enticement and limitations and appeared fixed since you became aware of it now seemed further away yes there was much more to claim for yourself so you increased your efforts but the horizon continued to recede recede and you came to the realization that the expansion of your awareness was a continuous process. That the things observed whispered of greater things to be observed. That the horizon did not encompass the whole. And slowly there came to you an awareness of infinity. The kind of infinity meant by Keats who described it as too huge for mortal tongue or pen of scribe. Then you started to wonder about this awareness and found that it expanded at a variable rate which was directly proportional to your ability to use what you had gained for the benefit of all. Then the true meaning of selfishness began to dawn upon your consciousness. You became aware that it was the one great obstacle that prevented you from reaching complete awareness of those things near the horizon and beyond. Selfishness brings clearly into focus those subjects in the foreground the items of interest to self were the objects of larger vision, 
those of infinitely greater value to the welfare of all appear obscure, undefined, and unattractive in the background. You realize the limitations you had placed upon your expanding awareness by favoring self and sought the way of selflessness, the path to greater service. And you have learned now of the beginning. At this time you see but through a glass darkly you cannot see the end or what the end truly is. As you realize the limitations of self and seek to serve others, gradually letting self become less and less a factor in your actions, your awareness will expand at an ever-increasing rate until when self no longer is a limiting factor, you reach the absolute rate of expansion of your awareness, where time stands still. Space is nowhere. Your consciousness is absorbed into the absolute. You have gained all and lost all. Time, space, the observer, and the observed are no more. Again, you are at once both nothing and everything, both nowhere and everywhere. This is the end. Thus the beginning and the end are one and the same. Thus passes the glory of the world. How could anybody write something like that? <laughs> well, that's for your calisthenics, mental calisthenics. You can write something better someday, I hope. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation and contemplation. So in the library you'll find all kinds of books written on the subject. Or oh, you won't find anything like Alpha and Omega. <laughs> now the great minds have tried to explain the meaning and substance of meditation and contemplation. They've tried to explain them in a way that might solidify them into a concrete idea that would be visualized and understood by people in all walks of life. It's important to define the meanings of these two words before entering into a discourse on the subject. Meditation is a continuous application of the mind to the consideration of religious or moral truth in order to promote personal wholeness, holiness, and the love of all that is divine. Contemplation is a state of rapt regard for things divine. It requires the ability to keep the selected idea in full mental view while giving earnest consideration to all of its obvious and hidden virtue. From these definitions you find that meditation and contemplation have much in common. In fact, meditation in its highest form brings one to the threshold of contemplation. Meditation requires the concentrated effort of the mind a one-pointed attention to the subject by the continued application of which one becomes aware of such qualities as, for instance, the shape and color of a thing. You can look at anything and meditate on it. 
when people meditate on the navel. I can think of other things that uh, be more attractive. Now, contemplation is the natural result of repeated meditation on the same subject. Meditation allows one to see. Contemplation allows one to feel. This is not feeling by the sense of touch, but rather by intuition. The lack of understanding of the words meditation and contemplation arises from our way of life. The first response to physical impressions occurs to man at or near the time of birth. This is the awakening of his consciousness and memory to the existence of forms and forces separate from himself. He becomes aware of certain physical desires that must be satisfied. Nourishment and sleep are the first important items. Time has the desire to exercise, also the curiosity about things seen, heard, and touched. He is developing conscious awareness of his surroundings on the physical plane of existence. If he is conscious at all of things spiritual, these are soon ignored as he becomes absorbed with the desires and needs of his physical existence. Thus, he narrows his awareness and recognizes only the things pertaining to the earth, being particularly concerned with the sources of supply, pleasure, and pain. The experiences of his waking hours tend to make him increasingly aware of his separateness from others. Soon he shows that he desires that which he enjoys for himself and is ready to take aggressive action if this privilege is denied him. As he grows older, the law of self-preservation becomes an important force in his life. He's ready to fight for what he believes to be his rights and to keep for himself what he has acquired thus far in his journey through life. He becomes involved in the treasures and pleasures of earth. He is faced on every side with regimentation, man-made laws, error, diversities of opinion as to what is right and what is wrong. Often he rebels against restrictions the selfishness of others, and even against himself. He reaches a stage of confusion. The highest recognized authorities differ on so many points. He can choose to ignore a subject, agree with one of the authorities, or form a theory or opinion of his own. False representation, misdirection, self-deception, fear, selfish desires, and other forces at work create illusions to his mind that for a time seem to eliminate the confusion. He joins up with somebody and he goes hook, line, and sinker, as they say. Everybody else is wrong except my little group. He has substituted illusion for confusion. He then believes that others who do not, do not agree with his concept are confused. <clears throat> Everybody is just is confused except thee and me, and sometimes have my doubts about thee. Isn't that what they say? 
<laughs> well, having passed from confusion into illusion, he may remain in this latter state for years, even unto death. Fortunately, some have experiences that dispel their illusions. The orderly nature of their thinking, which had followed a pattern acceptable to the masses, no longer becomes acceptable to themselves. These are people they called in the old days the unbelievers. Such a person passing out of a state of illusion will find his new thoughts in conflict with those he entertained in the past. His previously accepted ideas, the constant pressure of friends to restore him to his former state, the ridicule of his opponents, the pity of those who feel superior and are sure they are right, and a host of other forces such as doubt, fear, indecision, and loneliness will tend to drive him into seclusion. The world seems against him and bent on his destruction. His thinking becomes chaotic as tired of constant battle, he becomes weary and disinterested. Finally, in his loneliness and utter despair, he raises his voice like a child lost in the wilderness and utters a vocal prayer to God, asking to be shown the way, the truth, and the light. He is appealing, as it were, to the last tribunal. But his words seem to fall on the emptiness of space. Again and again, day after day, he repeats his impassioned plea. Trying to reach out and get response from that realm which he believes is far, far away where peace and understanding reign supreme. He receives no answer, no encouraging sign. He wonders if God has failed him. In silence he ponders over this apparent aloofness of the Heavenly Father. He begins to measure the effectiveness of the spoken prayer. It is true that he felt an elevation of the soul, a step nearer to the Almighty when he prayed aloud, but not, did not his heavenly Father know all his needs? Why then should he pray aloud? Without realizing it, he begins for him a new form of devotion, devotion meditative prayer. He thinks of the attributes of God, love, wisdom, justice, mercy, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and so on. He visualizes the majesty, beauty, and depth of being thus endowed. He is spiritually enlightened by a new concept of God. God is here now and always available regardless of time and space. The shadows of doubt and fear are dispelled. There is no longer a feeling of being alone. Continuing his meditations and visualizations of the divine attributes brings new understanding of the scriptures to him. God is very close. Yes, as the poet says, nearer than hands and feet. 
This latter thought, with all its implications, is startling. Spiritually, it was unacceptable to him, for he had been taught to regard himself as a sinner. Why should God be nearer to him than hands and feet? Here was something to be resolved. Physically, he could not conceive of two occupying the space of one. The proposition was untenable. He had reached an impasse. Yet, in spite of his reasoning, his inner consciousness whispered, It is true. God is nearer than hands and feet. Now is the time when such a man may cross the threshold into the hall of contemplation. If he does enter the hall of contemplation, he will find himself in a strange silence. The material world, including his physical body, takes on an aspect of unreality. He passes through the portal into an intuitive consciousness of the divine reality. At the threshold he touches the hem of his garment. Within the hall of contemplation it becomes enfolded in that garment. Continuing his contemplation by awaiting alertly for further knowledge, he becomes more and more aware of his affinity with the Supreme Being until at last he reaches the realization that all are one and the full significance of the word the Father dwelleth in me and I in him dawns upon his awakened spiritual consciousness. And he says, yes, indeed, God is nearer than hands and feet. What then are meditation and contemplation? They are steps that lead upwards from the plateau of vocal prayer, which has been described as speaking to God. They are, ad are advanced forms of prayer, which in its highest form is so simple that it is difficult to describe. Simple prayer has no words, no images, no ideas. The mind is pure, passive, non-selective, However, the consciousness is alert. A watchful, listening vigilance is maintained with an expectancy to receive impressions not generated by oneself or the mental or physical stimuli that abound on every hand, but from the supreme intelligence that transmits only truth and knows what one needs to know. Yes, this is prayer. When a man has reached this plateau, he is one with God. Now that sounds fine. How do you develop awareness? Well, we're talking about awareness on a non-material level. It's impossible to explore the subject of awareness without involving the mind, since the mind is that certain something which makes observation possible. In effect, then, we are about to investigate the nature of consciousness and the ways and means of expanding it into the areas beyond the normal commonplace experiences of day-to-day -day living. For purposes of study and analysis, the mind is often considered to be composed of two parts, the conscious and 
the subconscious. You know, it is less than 200 years ago that the first reference was made to the subconscious mind. Just think they got along without knowing anything about it all those years before. Suddenly we became illuminated 200 years ago. The term was intended to cover all of the mental structure except the conscious mind. So what does that amount to? All of the mental structure except the conscious mind. In order to judge that, you'd have to know what the whole mind was, wouldn't you? Investigations indicate that the conscious part of mind is only a small part of total mind, a very small part. And that exploration of the remainder can be as extensive as a survey of outer space. It is probable that the mind has no limits, and that the normal consciousness prevailing in our lives is an infinitesimal part of the whole. The part of our mentality that is not contained within the parameters of the conscious mind has been referred to as the subliminal mind because it was thought to lie beneath the limen or threshold of the normal level of conscious awareness. This limen or threshold is not a definite line of separation between the conscious mind and that which lies beyond because no such clear partition exists. The levels of mind blend into each other like the colors in a rainbow. The waking consciousness is what we all understand. Or at least we think we understand it. It is awareness on the everyday level of observations. Beyond this threshold lies the domain of supernormal powers. The waking consciousness is the world of noise. Beyond this threshold lies the state of silence, in which one finds the ability to consciously exercise the spiritual talent. When one becomes aware of the spiritual realm and its immutable laws, where well, one can effectively communicate with God, and upon realizing its infinite possibilities, become one with the divine, united in that state of wholeness in which the sense of separateness no longer exists. This is what lies beyond the level of a normal consciousness. Those who have witnessed demonstrations of extrasensory perception or extraordinary powers over physical things, as in spiritual healing, are prone to ask such questions as, how is it done? Or can I learn how to do these things? These and other questions can be answered best by an examination of the elements involved. In addition to mind, we shall find ourselves considering soul and spirit, because there are these two things that we shall become aware of in our development of higher power. And the development of higher power is nothing but the exercise of our spiritual talents or gifts with which everyone is endowed. Well, these days, there's great talk about entering the silence, the 
people from the east have come over here and uh, they've impressed upon us uh, that through meditation everyone should get into this sublime state. Well, it behoves us to take a look at what silence really is. Of course, we have a common definition, noiselessness, complete quietness or stillness. And if you are a hearing person, it means when there's nothing you can hear. Because if you can't hear, that doesn't apply to you. When we look upon noise in a neutral sense as a sound of any kind, What we call sound normally, of course, is the beating on the eardrums of airwaves. That's what you're getting when these loudspeakers move the air back and forth, amplified through the signals through these electronic gadgets here. Your ears are responding to airwaves. That's sound. But you know, the definitions of sound and noise, they leave out one very important thing. There has to be an observer present and capable of responding to the sound waves. There's no observer, there's no sound, is there? Now, if a person can make himself completely non-responsive to sound, noise simply does not exist. Though it may be pounding in his ears. He has shut it out. It doesn't exist for him. Now, we all know how difficult it is to find a place that's quiet. Practically impossible, isn't it? But it's nice to get away in the quiet sometimes. But we can't find it in a normal way. Perhaps we can find it another way, by going into the silence. You tune it all out. And you find a quiet place within, don't you? You know, complete silence could be very disturbing to some people, even to most people. If you've ever been in the Alley Court Chamber, the Bell Telephone Company, where all the sound generated is absorbed and there are no echoes, it would drive you crazy. You hear your heart thumping like a big pump. You hear the blood rushing through your veins. You hear your breathing like a big roar. You're not conscious of it normally, are you? But in the silence, you become conscious of those things. So it's impossible, it seems, for man to create a condition of absolute silence in the normal ways of physical science. But it can be done through the mind. We, in common with all other things, came out of the silence into this universe of sound. We left a state of perfect equilibrium, peace, and unity. The static condition of cosmic being. 
and entered the realm of dynamic change with its complexities, misunderstanding and confusion. In a way, seeking silence is an attempt to return to the point of the beginning and look across the threshold into the anechoic chamber of pure ideas. Be consciously aware of perfection, to view reality, to experience divine order, and to receive wisdom. The purpose of this exercise is to learn the nature of our native talent to discover our spiritual gifts, to increase our understanding of creative law, to receive direction, to be restored, to obtain knowledge, to gain assurance, and this leads to self-confidence, to strengthen our intellectual belief, and raise it to the level of that faith which can remove mountains, prepare ourselves for wider service, to increase the affinity between ourselves and goodness, and develop our awareness of God. Silence is greater than sound. All sound came out of silence vast nobility, grandeur, power, and beauty of the silence inspires the beholder with awe, wonder, and reverence. It is subject worthy of our most earnest and sincere attention. Silence is to sound what contra terrene matter is to the material world, a necessary but elusive companion. Strange as it may seem, when one starts along the path that leads to silence, interference appears to be the order of the day. One becomes discouraged by the frustrations. One is not yet ready to approach the silence. Perhaps the, cons the obstructions that are before us merely test one's ability to plan and overcome or to prove one's fortitude. Expect resistance not only by conditions imposed by others, but from latent desires within oneself. The approach to silence is through meditation. That's an exercise been practiced for thousands of years, nothing new. Each makes his own path of meditation. These paths have been described in the Oriental language. such as faith, obedience, love, devotion, and fortitude, and the scale of the mystic path. There are other descriptions. Will you make your own path? Progress is governed by ability to dis discipline oneself, not allow oneself to be lured by the dancing lights take you away from the true path. So meditation is an exercise of the mind in serious and sustained reflection on the object of interest. Make sure you have the right object of interest. In meditation, if you wish to reach the silence, you must contemplate the imperceptible.
Well, the first step towards silence is a devotional exercise in the form of continuous application of the mind to the contemplation of that object of reverence, the silence. You have to revere, revere the silence if you believe that everything came out of silence. Then you must have the right motivation. You should be motivated by a sincere desire to serve mankind in the most efficient and effective way with the native talents with which one is personally endowed. The objective is to reach the threshold to the abode of the Most High. The source of all power, all knowledge, and all creation. By meditation, one can be so mentally conditioned that the perfect law responds to the impulse or signal generated by one's need. The creative process is started and across the boundary of the unmanifest from the supplies in the form of ideas, knowledge, guidance, strength, healing, and whatever else. The objective is to reach the threshold to the abode of the most high. The source of all power, all knowledge, and all creation. By meditation, one can be so mentally conditioned that the perfect law responds to the impulse or signal generated by one's need. The creative process is started and across the boundary of the unmanifest from the supply in the form of ideas, knowledge, guidance, strength, healing, and whatever else may be necessary to fill the need. In other words, your need trigger off the reply from the source of all things. Now if the need is to be filled by material things which involve time and space, the reception in the physical form may not manifest immediately because time is required for the condensation of the waveform to obtain the density required for materialization. On a mental level, it happens much more rapidly. Well, the saints throughout the ages have been aware of this mysterious silence. Now they have attempted to show others how they felt about the subject. All the great thinkers knew about silence. That's where they got their ideas. Thomas Carlyle, the Scottish essayist and historian, he emphasized the magnitude of silence by saying, one loves to reflect on the great empire of silence, higher than all the stars, deeper than the kingdom of death. Silence alone is great, all else is small. My friend, the English poet Alexander Pope, I often refer to him, he said, Silence, coeval with eternity, thou wert, er, nature's self began to be, was that one vast nothing all, and all slept fast in thee. Now, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American poet, the philosopher, he said, let us be silent that we may hear the whisper of God. And John Keats, the English poet, said, heard melodies are sweet, but unheard melodies are sweeter. What did he hear? 
and hear something like the whispering of the gods? Students of Eastern philosophy are familiar with some sayings which translated read as follows. There's the voice of the silence, the voice of the spiritual sound, the soundless voice, the soundless sound. You all trying to describe something, they can't describe it. Quite obviously, they can't describe it. Something different. Something different. What you hear in the silence. You don't have any sound waves. Transmission of ideas. Necessity of becoming non-responsive to all external stimuli, if one is to receive from the silence, is stated clearly in the language of the East. When he has ceased to hear the many, he may discern the one, the inner sound which kills the outer. Now what they're trying to say there is that when that inner sound wells up within you, you do not hear anything else. Now I've tried to describe silence on this little chart that you see hanging around here and there. And I say there are three zones of silence, but remember everything blends into each other. So I define the first zone, I say it extends to the point where all noise of a physical nature is shut out. This is where the second zone starts. Here one becomes increasingly consciousness of thoughts that disturb the mind. A new kind of noise. Then the third and ultimate zone is the abode of God. It's called up the absolute silence. We have silence, deep silence, and absolute silence. Now when we speak of going into the silence, we speak of penetrating beyond the first zone, beyond the cut-off point of physical sound. Now you're not breaking the sound barrier, you're not getting any shock waves when you go through this exercise. It's more like uh, you're in a railroad station, sitting there all alone, a the train pulls out and you hear it chugging along down the railroad track, and finally you don't hear it anymore. Well that's what it's like when you're going out of the physical sound through this transition period into silence. You probably don't even notice it towards the end. One thing you do notice though, as sound disappears, do we understand it? is this new sound, this thought coming into your mind, all kinds of thoughts. That's why it's essential to keep your mind focused on your highest conception of the divine, because you will tune out a great number of thoughts. What does it feel like when you're going into this zone number two, the zone of the silence? The mind combines and reshapes many of these thoughts, some of them which are your own. And very strongly are the thoughts that you were thinking just before you went into the silence. 
with a little more juice in them, a little more power, a little more energy. They'll come back into your mind and perhaps experiences of the day. Ignore them. You don't want to combine those things together. Then it'll make you reach back into this storage compartment of your memory and pick out a few more things and start building a false picture. And it will completely occupy your attention unless you take steps to avoid it. So just pay no attention to it. So the problem then is not to allow the mind to frame these mental pictures and hang them on the walls of the library of consciousness where they may become the focal point of the attention. As in all mental action that is allowed to run uncontrolled, the imagery can grow to occupy the entire amphitheater of the conscious mind. Ah, uh, the stage is set. Then you're going to sit back and watch the play, aren't you? It has taken over. It has assumed control. And this is what I call the thought barrier. It is the first obstruction that opposes further penetration into the zone of deep silence. And I might say it's a barrier that many are unable to pass. See, they make the mistake of trying to fight those thoughts. And they keep them alive by fighting them. They must ignore them, and they will die a natural death. Now, one must be fully aware of the probability of meeting this obstacle that can slow down or completely divert the attention from the object of one's aspiration. Think you got over the first obstacle? That was easy. The second is a little more arduous. And I call it the sleep barrier. And it follows after the thought barrier. The tendency to fall asleep is very strong during the descent from the thought barrier into that valley of intense quiet and tranquility known as the deep silence. The experience is like that described by Longfellow when he said, Thou driftest gently down the tides of sleep. And you will go to sleep unless you're very careful. Very enticing to go to sleep. That's why you shouldn't meditate when you're tired, because you will go to sleep. It is essential that consciousness be maintained both during the deep silence and also on the return journey back up the slopes to the realm of sound and sensation. Even more important is the need to hold in the pure, unadulterated state those ideas or impressions received in the silence. To accomplish this, it is necessary to insulate oneself from the bombardment of thought forms to which one must pass on the way back to consciousness on the physical level. Maybe you are traveling the same path that you went through when you went down into the silence. Immediately upon return to the physical level of sensibility, one must write down the pure ideas or impressions brought back from the deep silence. It is unwise to cogitate or rationalize on the message you received until after they have been reduced to writing. In this way, one can make many later excursions 
from the original ideas, but will always be able to return to the pure ideas as first received in the silence. If you don't do this, you will lose the very essence of what you received. I think it would be helpful to discuss some of the feelings that one goes through. You might call them withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> because you withdraw, draw, withdrawing from this world of sensation to a different kind of consciousness. Because they vary with the individual, will usually they include a reduction in one's awareness of his physical body. I often said that when I was giving healing, my physical body to me had no weight, had no tiredness. It had no feeling. because I was tuned out of the world of sense and I was in the world of spirit something like a mental anesthetic if you want to call it that so you will experience this as you go into the silence and it's practically impossible to go into the silence if you are aware of your physical body How can you shut out the world of sense if you're aware of this thing which is full of sense, sometimes nonsense? So I expect this. So you've got to get into a nice, comfortable position. But remember, you are not going to sleep. You hope. It's also very common to find a sensation like a pressure bound around the head, right around the forehead. And so there's a band around there, pressing, squeezing. And of course you will feel this loss of weight because your body won't have any weight at all. Wonderful thing if you're overweight too, I think. Then there's a strange thing that happens to your sense of perception. The physical and material manifestations are losing their apparent state of reality. They don't look real to you anymore. But you do have a feeling that something more substantial lies beyond them. Yeah, now you start to get across the threshold. And this certain something which seems to lie beyond, you get a strange feeling that that really is sustaining the things that we saw and felt were real. And then sometimes there is a sensation of whirling or giddiness. Everybody doesn't get this, but some people do slightly disturbing and it feels like uh, I imagine if you're going to faint or something of that nature but you're not going to faint I'll tell you what it is it's the withdrawal of the consciousness from the physical level and you're really between two worlds you're changing stations. You're getting onto a different vibration. There's no need for apprehension. Just remain calm. Have faith in God. And everything will be all right. 
Now on the plane of forces, which is all about us, one may have many experiences. That's his famous thought plane. And just as the world is filled with confusion, so is the plane of forces. All the confusing thoughts in the world are there, plus a lot more, because you have all the thoughts of the confused individuals over there that went over with some beliefs which weren't true. And over there they're more confused than they were here. After all, I belong to the ABC religion, which was absolutely right and everybody else was wrong. Why do I see the XYZ people here too? Very confusing, isn't it? I must have gotten into the wrong place. And I thought I did everything I was told to do. Get me into heaven. <laughs> Seen some of these people. Then you find the people over there, of course, uh, that were killed instantly. They don't believe they're dead. Life is so real over there. They don't believe they're dead. You know what I told you the story about the man who was killed on the railroad? In fact, <coughs> he came back to work and complained that the other people wouldn't talk to him. I knew he was dead, but he didn't. Going back to work. Killed on the railroad track, just outside the plant. Came right on to, into work, didn't know he was killed. Well, how am I going to convince him that he's dead? I said, those your tools on the bench over there? Yeah. Don't bring me your hammer. You know where to pick up the hammer, because you can't pick up the hammer. That's how I convinced him he was dead. He was very much alive. Very nice fellow, by the way, too. So you can see this confusion over there. We're going to get through that as quickly as possible. Going and coming back. Or you will be confused also. Not easy. Now, you know, when you're getting down into the deep silence, when you get into this thing I call the gate of peace, ah, oh, so beautiful. Yeah. Some people hear beautiful music. If they're musicians, they will hear music they've never heard the like of. And it will put them to sleep. Got to ignore it. Now the question often arises as to whether or not everyone is qualified to attempt to enter the deep silence and as to one's chance of reaching the deep silence. Well, I can only say this, that only one whose aims are worthy, whose aspirations are high, whose designs are wise and whose purposes are steadfast may hope to reach this sublime state and then only with constant effort to be worthy of this achievement. Let's take a little break. So I would say that the object you use or concentration, if you want to use that word, outlives its usefulness when you find that your attention is leaving the object. Buy yourself a new hat. You will find that this is uh, very true. You, people start looking at the black spots 
in the center of a piece of paper that was being folded from corner to corner this way and where the two is pulled across it. A little ink spot in the center and hang it on the wall and they stare at that black spot. Well, if I did that very long, I'd be seeing spots in front of my eyes in a short time. So that method wouldn't be uh, very good for me. In fact, um, I don't look at any objects when I uh, uh, do, any, do meditating. But I turn my thoughts to the divine and uh, it doesn't have any spots. But everybody has their own way of starting out. Now, a friend of mine, uh, a room full of uh, Hindu uh, works of art. Beautiful. Probably got thirty, forty thousand dollars worth in there. And he sits in that meditating room. And I'm sure that he gets something from these objects. Now, whether he looks at each one separately at uh, different times to uh, satisfy his mood, I don't know, but I know I, I sat in his meditating room, the meditation room as he calls it, and I could feel the influence from uh, these objects which had been uh, venerated uh, by the followers for a thousand years. You can't have some group of people looking at something for a thousand years without giving it some kind of uh, vibes, right, to put it in the modern language. And I could actually feel, and I could see the colors coming from these religious objects. Very good uh, vibes. Now that suits his particular uh, uh, type of uh, concentration problem, you see. Well, dimensions, of course, to the average person give you the size of a thing. Levels give you its location. In a non-material sense, dimensions uh, vary with your concept of what is in the non-material. In the spirit world, you have a sense of size just like you have here. So I think that explains that part of it. But when you talk about levels, levels of consciousness, the best way to explain that in terms which everybody understands is the television, which um, has a number of stations, from 2 to 83 or something like that. You could call these all different levels of television consciousness. They're on different frequencies. And when you're on one, you're not conscious of what's going on on the other levels. It's all coming out of the same instrument, isn't it? Now, in the spirit world and in the mental world, in the world of consciousness, you have the same condition. And you determine by your way of living and thinking which station you turn on and you bring in then everything that's active in that particular station now as you progress spiritually you change the station but it doesn't change like it does on television where you change from channel 2 to channel 5 or 7 or something that is a sudden complete change in the spirit world I haven't noticed any differences radically in that fashion. There's a gradual change, just like you grow older. You grow in spiritual consciousness and understanding, and if you keep your mind seeking always higher and higher levels, you are going to raise your level of consciousness by always living in the upper half of it. Does this explain you? Speaking mathematically. In a three dimensional world, we have length, breadth, and thickness. That's okay, about five, five feet six inches high. 
24 inches wide and 18 inches thick, not in the head, through the body. That's three dimensions, right? Now you add time to it, you say, well, he's 35 years old or 65 years old, or something. now he's a four dimensions, so he's got time in there. That's four dimensions. Time added to three dimensional space. You have to have four dimensions to lay, locate moving planets perspective to each other. Because they're all on the move. So you've got to get that time dimension in there in order to locate planets. Now I know there's a metaphysical fourth dimension, which is outside of the three dimensions that we live in. And uh, <coughs> this is where you can transport yourself mentally, what they call traveling clairvoyance. In other words, you can do what the television does, you can see what's going on over in California. If you have these powers, that's a fourth dimension because you've got a different kind of time in there met metaphysically. What I do disapprove of is having a, a college girl meditating for five hours a day when she's supposed to be doing her homework and going to college. I disapprove of that. She was a nervous wreck when she came to me. That's too much, isn't it? Yes, I agree entirely with what you're saying, because when you look at an object, what are you seeing? You're seeing it with your mind, aren't you? And you can see it just as clearly with your mind if the object isn't there. In fact, if you get 20 people with trained minds, and you sit around in a dark room, and you tell everybody to visualize a yellow rose in the center of the room, I can assure you that everyone will see a yellow rose in the center of the room, even though there's none there physically. Yes, everybody has their own way of concentrating. If you want to concentrate on a holy picture, for instance, some people do that. It has a meaning to them. I mean, it's not the picture itself. It's what it represents. Statues have meaning to people. What they represent, what's behind it. Depends on the person. There's some people would be scared to death to sit alone. Other people would prefer to sit alone. They're scared the other fellow. See? So as long as you have fortitude and courage, you can sit alone. But not all day. You've got to get work done. Well, you see, if you're looking at an object, then, uh, of course, you meditate with your eyes open. But if you are using a mental uh, concept, like the gentleman over here mentioned, then you would have your eyes closed, unless you're in a pitch dark room. Because if you have your eyes open, and you're trying to get away from the world of sensation, naturally you're going to see everything that's around, even though you've got your eyes focused, unless you've got tunnel vision. So, I prefer to sit in the dark, didn't cost any for electricity that way. I could study blood in me. And uh, I prefer to sit with my eyes closed so I don't have to put forth the effort to keep my eyelids up. I'm trying to get into a state of complete physical relaxation so I'm not aware of my physical body or any external influence. That's the way I do it. Other people try different ways. Yes, I have perfect white light. Perfect white light. In everything, including you, Charlie. Don't put any doubts in your mind now. <laughs> now, the perfect white light, which you experience in illumination, is a light that throws no shadows. You ever see a light that didn't throw shadows? Well, I'll tell you where that light is. It's inside of each one of you. And when you stop blotting it out, it will radiate from you. And how can it throw a shadow when you are the light? 
The shadows are all behind the object, aren't they? You wouldn't see them. That's the light that I use as a symbol of God, omnipresence. Of course you can. It's not easy. You can meditate if you're in pain, but you get yourself out of consciousness with the pain. And I say, that's not easy. It's possible. Well, <clears throat> you get the same thing when you go out of the body as uh, you do it in sleep at night. Most people don't re remember it. But there's a whirling sensation which takes place. And if you've ever gone out of your body or come back into it consciously, you would experience this whirling sensation. And some people in meditation do have the same experience. In that case, I would say they are leaving their physical body, yes. Well, you see, you turn your attention to an object, in this case, which was pain, and you shut out even the pain itself by concentrating on it. Fritz Chrysler, I think it was, uh, played his violin through a brain operation. He took out the, the uh, frontal bone, operated on the brain. Who was it? Well, it was a violinist, anyway. He's the only one I think of when I'm talking about violin. But anyway, uh, played the violin, this son played the violin through the entire operation, felt no pain whatsoever, had no anesthetic. So this is just what can be done with the mind. We're talking about two separate things there. You can travel astrally and bring back nothing. A lot of people just go around in circles all the time. You know, they more at the end of a life than they did at the beginning. Figuratively speaking, that is. However, in meditation, there is a goal. You have the mind focused on a goal, the highest conception of the divine and you are getting into attunement with the source of all knowledge. You expect and you hope to receive some knowledge. Now you are in what you have chosen to call a higher uh, dimension or frequency when you are receiving. But if you had a nice clean sheet and you dragged it through the atmosphere on a muggy day from your neighbor's house across the street to yours, it wouldn't be near as pure and clean as when she took it out of the washing machine. And this is what happens if you're not careful when you return from the high state of awareness experienced in the deep silence. If you don't insulate yourself from the pollution, you will pick it up on the way back and the ideas you receive will form combinations which will not be the truth as you received it in the silence. That's what I meant. Well, first of all, you would have to develop clairvoyance and you can imagine I wasn't trying to be clairvoyant back in the factory at that time, but... Um, yeah, I know. Were you talking about the people in the groups? Or, oh, I thought you were talking about the people in the spirit world. You are sitting in a group now for development. You're sitting in a group for development. You want to know uh, how you can get the members of the group to understand this? Well, all 
August says, let me repeat it. August says that you want to be able to tell the people in your group how they will know they're dead. Is this true? That's part of the way. Getting there now. Well, I'll tell you. Just tell her to go and try to put out the light that's burning. That's how I found out I was in my spiritual body, but I wasn't dead. I didn't know I wasn't dead, and I didn't know I was out of my physical body, but I tried to put the light out, and my hand went through the wall, and because of my, my knowledge, I knew then that I was out of my physical body. But it's a matter of experience. Well, the church, of course, as Olga said, is not telling people what happens at death, the lady at the grave. Tell you what a good fellow you were and all that business. But uh, Jesus, of course, he, uh, through the immortality, by coming back, and he had to prove to the other people that he came back that he was alive. It's a little more difficult to come back and prove you're alive after you're over there than it is to prove that you're dead when you leave here. Yes, well... The difference was the materialization, you see. You have a spiritual body, but it is not a materialized body. The spiritual body is not a temporary thing like a materialized body. Now, this is a materialized body. It has temporary existence, three score years and ten. I'm living on borrowed time now. I don't always get the right out of all this. <laughs> Now, a materialized body is a very temporary body. Maybe last three, four minutes, maybe an hour. Now, in a materialized body, they extract from a physical body a certain substance called ectoplasm, sensible gas. Anyway, it's a substance extracted from the physical body of a medium and also in a small amount from the bodies of those in the room. This is a substance almost like a gas. It is idioplastic, in other words, you can mold it with your mind. And the chemists that know how can extract from the walls and the atmosphere and the carpets and your clothing. Material particles are mix these material particles with the ectoplasm and make a temporary form that resembles your body if you are the one that's materializing. If you can remember what you look like, most women can, but men have a little difficulty. Now, this materialized form can talk to you, and if it is good materialization, the features will be recognizable. The, the language spoken will be the language used by the person with a particular dialect or accent. Such a materialized form can pick up a material object because it is in itself material. In fact, there uh, are records of where a piano was picked up and carried across the room and set down on the other side when there was no room to move the piano around the people because the size of the table and the people sitting around it took up all the space on the other side. So this ectoplasm can be made into 
something as solid as rock or something like a vapor. Well, it is, it is quite common for a ruling to be made in materialization that you do not touch the materialized spirit. One of the reasons is because there are certain electrical laws involved. And if you shot it out, the thing would collapse, you see. Another one is that you are touching a substance out of the inside of the body of a person, a medium. And you don't want to, you know, pass anything along into the medium or shock the medium. Now, in some cases, they, they have asked from one case I know in Washington where somebody asked for permission to photograph materialized form. And they were given permission to photograph materialized form, a flashlight photograph. And they were told to use flashlight powder. Well, the man didn't have any flashlight powder. He said, what's the difference? He used black powder. And the result was they had not prepared the conditions to take care of the black powder light and the medium was blind, he lost his eyesight. So, uh, you see, these are things we know very little about and you have to be very careful. Of course, these same things are used by fraudulent uh, uh, mediums so they won't be grabbed and proved to be frauds. They don't want anybody to, to uh, upset the apple cart. Yes, it's all a matter of the conditions. I, with all you, have been completely wrapped in ectoplasmic robes with a spirit talking to the spirit. The conditions were so good, there was no danger of shock. At other times, I myself would not have attempted to touch the spirit. But it's all a matter of the conditions. If you've got perfect harmony, nobody will be hurt. We took uh, some German friends of ours once to a, a, uh, get a psychic experience and uh, spirit materialized and this German woman, she had never had such an experience and everything was so real, she put her arms around <coughs> spirit and hugged it. And of course it just melted right in her arms and uh, he said, don't do that, but uh, it didn't do any harm. Now, in regard to questions answered by Ambrose at the end of Lecture 3, there was not room for all of them at the end of Tape 3, so they are continued here. There are some German friends of ours who once to a, a, uh, get a psychic experience on uh, spirit materialized and this German woman, she had never had such an experience and everything was so real, she put her arms around <coughs> spirit and hugged it. And of course it just melted right in her arms and uh, she said, don't do that. But uh, it didn't do any harm because it was low there, you see. You maintain your focus on the highest conception of the divine. In other words, you go down there and your mind is focused. I'm saying down, I'm supposed to stay up, according to some people. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. You're going in a certain place and you have a, your mind focused on the light. Now, when you return, you don't turn around, turn your back on the light and come back again. You keep the mind focused on the light and go backward, if you want to put it that way. This way, you don't get contaminated on the way back. Yeah. 
Well, it depends on the conditions. Dr. Day used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and do his meditating, but I don't know whether most people would want to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. But it's just the right time for him. So I say the best time is when you are not too tired and uh, when you are free and uh, spend five minutes on it. If you find five minutes, don't spend five hours because the average person has other things to do. There's a young man back there, I know he's been trying for a while. No, I, I have not. I have not visited any, any other planet. I haven't seen the men in the moon or the men in Mars. I haven't been to any of those planets. Now, Swedenborg, uh, I understand, did some traveling to those planets. But I haven't read his work, so I, although I've got them at home. <laughs> Well, we can all do that, I suppose. No, I, I, I have never been on another planet, to my knowledge. That's it, that's it. No, it's not unusual to uh, have tears running down. Uh, that's a form of relaxation. Form of relaxation. Oh, I can go to the movies. I can cry any time. Eh? <laughs> Don't go to the movies very often. Once in five years or something. <laughs> In this work? Well, you don't particularly want to insulate yourself from the thoughts of others. You want to insulate yourself from thoughts which will move you in the wrong direction. You see what I mean? There's a difference. There are some thoughts of other people that are very beneficial, and you should be open to the beneficial thoughts. Uh, the way you insulate yourself is by focusing the mind. And if you focus the mind on your highest conception of the divine, then you have insulated yourself from all harmful thoughts. Very simple. In other words, two people on a harmonious relationship, one of them passes into the spirit world and the other remains on earth. Communication between two such persons should be possible if they understand that communication is possible. If they think it's impossible, then it would be impossible because they think so. If it happened to be a person who thinks that when a person dies, they lay in the grave until the trumpet sounds on Judgment Day, naturally the one left behind thinking the same way wouldn't be open to any communication from the other side at all. It's a matter of the, the way people think. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, I can tell you now, Bob, Jessie Hazlett is here, and she says thank you for thinking about me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Well, I've got one, one last question for you. Uh, I think you believe that the guardian angels have come with us from the end of the world, and these so-called guardian angels are have all been existed in the time of now. Where, where did he come from before we get into the earth realm? Did he give us? He does. 
<coughs> well, you came from Alpha. We came from Alpha. We came out of the science. But this, this is the first experience, the first conscious experience you experienced, your experience. That is the first experience, yes. Your experience, you believe, is the first conscious experience yeah. we have. And then we start from there. That's right. Okay. We want to thank you for being such a good uh, group of students, and uh, God willing, we'll be here next week, will be our final meeting, and I hope that you're getting something out of it. Are you? Is this what you wanted? Uh, next week, Ambrose is going to speak on spiritual healing, the law of governing spiritual healing. Spiritual healing, he says, and he'll give it to you as only he knows how to give it to you. So God bless you all and be with you and be real sweet to yourselves. Fred, would you say? And we now close our meeting with prayer. Most gracious Father God, we give thee thanks for the high wisdom that has come down to us this day. Help us ever to keep our consciousness open to this light, to this pure white light that illuminates, that cleanses, that shows us the path clearly that we would follow for greater development and greater understanding and greater service to others. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen.